1995, director Joel Schumacher took over the director's seat for Warner Brothers' third Batman movie, Batman Forever. Gone was Tim Burton's dark, brooding, and often violent atmospheres. Instead, Batman was now entering a world of bright neon lights, 90s pop music, rubber bat nipples, and this extra who yells out, Batman! Ah! Needless to say, Schumacher had a much different interpretation of what Batman is compared to Burton. Whereas Burton, who saw Batman as a dark gothic tale with elements of noir and pulp comics, Schumacher saw Batman as being much more bright and colourful and comic book orientated, particularly focusing on the 1950s era of Batman. In fact, it could be argued that Batman Forever isn't even a sequel to Tim Burton's first two Batman movies, due to the fact that it looks and feels different. So for better or worse, we get Batman Forever, the movie where Val Kilmer stars as Bruce Wayne and Batman, who must save Gotham City from the evil clutches of Two-Face, played by Tommy Lee Jones, and the Riddler, played by the show-stealing Jim Carrey, while guiding fellow orphan Dick Grayson, a rebellious teenage 30-year-old who becomes Robin. Along with coming to terms with his inner demons with the strangely highly over-sexualized psychologist Dr. Chase Meridian, played by Nicole Kidman. And not forgetting, of course, Batman! Ah! <laughs> you see, when Batman Forever first came out, not only did it do well in the box office, but it also got loads of praise from people who were happy to see Batman return to a more light-hearted formula with none of that brooding or violence from the Tim Burton Batman movies. Yeah, 1995 was a completely different time. Long before superheroes being taken seriously and being allowed to be dark was a thing. It's only really in modern times that people have been asking, is Batman Forever all that it was cracked up to be in 1995? Or is it just an open doorway to what led to the disastrous Batman and Robin? Well, today we are going to try and discover if Batman Forever is a good movie by today's standards or just a product of its time. A time when people didn't want to take superheroes seriously. As we look into 10 things that you probably didn't know about Batman Forever. Number 10. It was originally a Tim Burton movie. Yes, Tim Burton, who was at the helm of 1989's Batman and 1992's Batman Returns, was already working on the next Batman adventure, which was to be titled Batman Continues, which was to see the return of Michael Keaton for the role, along with Marlon Wayans, who was to be Dick Grayson and Robin. Wayans was actually cast in the role of Robin for Batman Returns before the character was written out of that movie's script, with the promise that he will return in the sequel. Burton's Batman Continues was to also feature Robin Williams as the Riddler, along with the turn of Billy Dee Williams as Harvey Dent and Two-Face, along with Rene Russo as Dr. Chase Meridian. There are even some claims that the third Burton Batman movie was also going to see the return of Catwoman, especially considering the end of Batman Returns is revealed that Catwoman is still alive. It's unclear how far Burton had gone in developing Batman Continues, but it is believed that many of his ideas and designs still managed to make its way into the final finished movie of Batman Forever. One thing that did change from Burton's original script is that apparently the Riddler at one stage was going to have a sidekick pet rat. So yeah, it's probably a good thing that we didn't get that, although maybe it would have worked. Also in the original script, the Riddler wasn't Edward Nigma, but Lyle Heckendorf, an eccentric genius who after stalking Bruce Wayne to the circus, finds his iconic green and question mark threads from under the big top itself. Number 9, Batman Forever could have been a prequel. So it was while Burton was gearing up for his third outing into the world of the Dark Knight, when McDonald's came along and said, Oh, hold up! That last Batman movie you made was way too inappropriate. It had Batman killing people, along with the Penguin spewing out green vomit. How can we sell Happy Meal toys to a movie which has green vomit? So wanting Batman Forever to feel more safe and more family friendly, Burton was asked by Warner Brothers to step down as director, where he became the movie's producer, even though there are no pictures of Tim Burton on the set of Batman Forever. Well, none that I could find anyway. 
And before people start pointing fingers and blaming Schumacher for making Batman a safer, dumber place, keep in mind he originally wanted the movie to be a dark prequel, which was to be loosely based on Frank Miller's Batman Year One, and was to be a Batman prequel showing the transition of Bruce Wayne being a grieving orphan to crime-fighting creature of the night. But despite the fact that Batman Forever didn't become a prequel, it made sense for the next villains explored in the franchise to be the Riddler and Two-Face. The Riddler first appeared in Detective Comics number 140 in 1948, whom was shown to be a criminal mastermind who likes to give clues to the police and Batman of his next crimes. The Riddler would continue to show up every now and then to taunt Batman. But the character really became popular thanks to the 1960s TV show, where the character was played by Frank Gorshin. Harvey Dent, aka Two-Face, first appeared in Detective Comics 66 in 1942. Harvey Dent was shown to be a district attorney, who had one side of his face horrifically scarred after a mobster throws acid in his face during a trial, where he becomes Two-Face and commits crimes with the aid of his double-sided coin, which helps him to decide the outcome of his deeds. The character would go on to become one of the most darkest Batman villains in the mythology, with the character often exploring themes of mental illness and corruption of the soul. And in some renditions, Harvey Dent is even shown to be good friends with Bruce Wayne before his accident, which adds to the complexities to the hero and villain relationship between Batman and Two-Face. Which is why I was slightly disappointed with how Two-Face was portrayed in Batman Forever. I think they just went about the character all wrong and made him less tragic and more like a buffoon. It's like Tommy Lee Jones saw Jack Nicholson's Joker in the original Batman movie and thought, oh yeah, that's how the villain should be played. He just didn't have the inner depths or anxieties of Two-Face and made him just like, well, as mentioned, the Joker. I mean, say what you want to say about Joel Schumacher and his cartoon sound effects and bat nipples. He was actually ahead of his time and actually wanted a movie that was solely focused on Bruce Wayne actually becoming Batman. A Batman origin story. An idea that was finally realised ten years later with Batman Begins. Number 8. Batman and Robin Alternatives so with Schumacher stepping into the world of Batman meant a lot of casting Burton had in mind for the third Batman movie were let go. Michael Keaton left the project even though he was scheduled to star in the movie, to the degree that suits for the movie were even being modelled after him. He left because he felt that Schumacher was taking the movie in a more light-hearted and campy direction, although there are some claims that he just wasn't really interested after the departure of Tim Burton. Robin Williams was let go as being the Riddler, and Williams would go on to say that he felt that he was screwed over by Batman twice. Once when he lost the role of the Joker to Jack Nicholson, and then losing the role of Riddler to Jim Carrey. Billy D. Williams was replaced with Tommy Lee Jones, because Schumacher wanted to work with Jones again after working with him on The Client. Along with Marlon Wayne's being let go of the Robin character for the second time. So the big question was, who would be the next Batman and Robin? Actors considered for Batman include Kurt Russell, Ethan Hawke, Alec Baldwin, Ray Fiennes, Tom Hanks, Johnny Depp and Daniel Day-Lewis. But Schumacher really wanted Val Kilmer. Hence the famous story that Kilmer got the part while in a cave while filming The Ghosts and the Darkness. When Kilmer was cast in the role, Schumacher replaced Rene Russo as the love interest with Nicole Kidman, thinking that Russo would be too old for Kilmar. Other actresses considered for the part include Sandra Bullock and Cindy Crawford. Schumacher searched high and low for a new Robin, and even took to the UK to try and find new talent, and some of the young actors tested for the part of Robin include Leonardo DiCaprio, Ewan McGregor, Jude Law, and even future Batman Christian Bale. Now that would have been awkward. Chris O'Donnell ended up cast as the 90s motorbike riding boy wonder, as he caught Schumacher's eye while promoting the movie Circle of Friends. Number 7. On Set Feuds The set of Batman and Robin must have been a pretty volatile place, as there are several stories floating around about feuds that took place while making the movie. It's been famously pointed out several times that Tommy Lee Jones did not like Jim Carrey, and supposedly even told Carrey that he hated him and his films. At the time when the movie was being made, there were stories going around the media of tensions between Val Kilmer and Jim Carrey. But Kilmer insists that that wasn't the case, and that the two actually generally got along really well. 
but the most damning of all the supposed clashes that took place was between Kilmer and Forever's director, Joel Schumacher. Joel Schumacher found Kilmer to be, quote, rude and inappropriate, childish and impossible. And the tension was so awkward, Kilmer didn't even talk to Schumacher for a whole two weeks while filming the movie. The documentary movie Lost Soul, which is about the troubled making of the movie The Island of Dr. Moreau, which came out a year after Batman Forever, offers a deep insight into what it was actually like to work with Val Kilmer, where he was shown to be narcissistic, impossible to work with, and a downright egotistical bully, which led to that movie's original director, Richard Stanley, to get fired. Look, this isn't all about trashing Val Kilmer. I know that in recent years, he has suffered serious health problems, but he also seems to have made a recovery, and he also now seems to be more down to earth, and if that's true, then more power to him. It's good to move on and become better people. But it must also be noted that according to many sources, he was extremely hard to work with at the highest of his career. Number 6. Jim Carrey's Hairy Proposal There were several names floating around as to who could play the Riddler, one of them being Matthew Broderick. And apparently even Michael Jackson was reaching out to star as the criminal trickster. Or in this case, the smooth criminal trickster. However, casting Jim Carrey was something of a game changer, as at that time he was becoming a huge megastar and pop cultural phenomenon in his own right, having starred in Ace Ventura Pet Detective, The Mask and Dumb and Dumber. When he was cast in the role, there were questions as to how the Riddler would look, with several wigs being made up, including the coral one which would be used along with a black one, blue one and silver one. However, Kerry had different ideas. He wanted to actually have the hair on his head cut into the shape of a question mark. Yep, the Riddler with a giant hairy question mark on his head. I don't know if I really like the idea or really hate it. Number 5. Dark Deleted Scenes There are several deleted scenes which would have made Batman Forever a much darker film with much more adult themes. The movie originally started at Arkham Asylum, where Dr. Burton, the doctor who we see at the end of the movie, discovers that Two-Face has escaped from the asylum with the Bat Must Die written on the prison wall in the dead prison guard's blood. I mentioned before that some of Burton's ideas transpired into Batman Forever, and I can't help but think that this is one of those ideas, because to me this premise seems very Burton-ish. One of the subplots in the movie focuses on Bruce Wayne coming to terms with his parents' deaths, and his life choices as being Batman. In fact, notice how that subplot never really gets resolved. Well, that's because that story's resolution was removed from the movie, in which Bruce Wayne accepts himself as Batman by coming face to face with a giant bat demon in his mind, where he faces his fear and is no longer afraid and embraces his dual identity. It's actually both really creepy and powerful, and almost a crime that it was removed from the movie. Not to mention the fact that it was actually a really important scene in the movie, as it shows Bruce Wayne choosing to be Batman rather than feeling like he has to be. Hence the movie's title, Batman Forever. In the end of the movie, we see both Batman and Robin run towards the camera. But the original ending saw them looking down on the city on some gothic architecture, very reminiscent to the ending of the original 1989 movie. And as far as other deleted scenes go, well the less we say about the scene where Batman walks into a hairdressing salon where everyone seems to laugh at him for some reason, the better. And then there is this really creepy image of the Riddler knocking Chase Meridian out with a giant syringe. I can remember before watching the movie seeing this picture in a Batman Forever picture book, and I found it to be really icky and made the Riddler seem that bit more sinister. It was only after picking the book up a few years later that I was like, oh yeah, that picture of the Riddler and his giant needle, that wasn't in the actual movie. So it'd be interesting to see if the footage is actually around somewhere. The comic book adaptation actually offers quite a few deleted scenes that weren't in the movie, such as the Riddler and Two-Face chillaxing on Two-Face's couch using the Riddler's mind box, where it seems to make them high. And Two-Face says that Jim Morrison was right about everything, <laughs> whatever that means. It's an interesting notion of having Edward Nigma's mind box as being like a drug. And I do wonder if that was to be explored in the original script. And this isn't so much a deleted scene, but this early publicity photo of Tommy Lee Jones as Two-Face is really interesting, as I'm guessing it was taken before filming actually begun, as he's wearing a completely different suit, 
one that we never actually see in the film, and his two-faced makeup looks different. It's less red and more dark purple with a tint of silver. They probably changed it because they probably felt that this look was too horrific for kids. And that's not the only rejected design. H.R. Giger was originally hired to design a new Batmobile for Batman Forever, where he designed what could best be described as red bat scissors. <laughs> Needless to say, this design was rejected. Number four, ambiguity over Robin's costume. Robin first entered the Batman mythos in Detective Comics 38 in 1940, where the circus performer turned orphan gets taken in by Bruce Wayne, where he becomes Batman's sidekick Robin. And his early costume design was influenced by old illustrations of Robin Hood. The question is, what would Robin of the 90s look like? Warner Brothers had been wanting to bring Robin into the Batman cinematic franchise ever since 1989's Batman but Burton always opted not to have the character turn up. However, finally in Batman Forever, the Robin character made his leaps and bounds onto the big screen. This posed the question of how to display Robin on the big screen. Well, it seems that this was a tricky question indeed, as the suit design went through various looks and changes, as it seemed it was no easy challenge to make Robin look with the times while also being recognisable. Ironically, the image that was chosen for Robin wasn't even based on Dick Grayson's look, but it was based on the character Tim Drake, who took on the mantle of Robin in the comics in the early 90s. Yeah, look, it's really a geek thing to point out that Robin's costume in Batman Forever isn't based on Dick Grayson, but Tim Drake, but still worth mentioning. Number three, Kenner's Bat Toys of Plastic Awesomeness. Ever since the days of Star Wars, Kenner has been giving eager toy enthusiasts awesome action figure movie tie-ins. And as with the case of 1989's Batman and Batman Returns, Kenner took the helm to make figures for Batman Forever. This time they were larger and chunkier and more robust than before, and slightly more flamboyant. This time around the figure lineup just didn't really do it for me, but that could be because I was getting older and no longer interested in figures at that time. But nevertheless, I still had plenty of plastic action-packed fun with this lineup, despite the fact that I thought that it was the weaker link when compared to the first two lineups. Also, I think the toys were made before the movie designs were completed, as Robin has a completely different costume and logo. Look at that. Number two. Tim Burton hated the movie's title. Although Batman Forever was met with great praise when it was released, making $335 million at the box office, there were still some big names who were sceptical of some of the changes made to the tone of Batman. Original director Tim Burton disliked the name Batman Forever and compared it to a bad tattoo someone would get printed on themselves when drunk. And this is coming from the guy who was going to call the movie Batman Continues. Batman's very own co-creator Bob Kane hated the bat nipples, which was added by Schumacher to make the costumes resemble Greek gods. And Batman animated series producer Bruce Timm said that he did not enjoy Schumacher's Batman at all. Which makes sense considering Batman Forever was much more slapstick compared to the animated series, which was surprisingly dark and adult-like. Number one, making it hip for the kids. Despite the original Batman from 1989 having its awkward use of Prince songs, it was decided to make Batman Forever appeal more to the youngsters and give it an almost MTV feel in order to reach out to the teenage demographic. Hence why the Robin character was given an earring. Because in the 90s, nothing screams cool like an earring. The movie's soundtrack alone is full of songs by artists who were big in the charts at the time. And I always felt like the movie's direction almost feels like a music video which actually would have made sense as Joel Schumacher had a history in directing music videos for acts such as In Excess. As for the musical artists used for the film, well, did you know that Seal's song Kiss From A Rose was actually made for the Batman Forever soundtrack? Yeah, despite the fact the song itself never appears in the movie and the lyrics have nothing to do with Batman or the events in the film. In fact, it would have made more sense using the song for Batman and Robin, as it would have tied in with the Poison Ivy character who had a deadly kiss and love of flowers. Kiss from a Rose has gone on to become a classic song, and yet it all started with Batman Forever. Hence the music video where Seal is performing the song on the Batman Forever set. 
But it seems that making Batman cool and trendy for the kids worked. As Batman Forever was big business when it came out, it even broke Jurassic Park's record of highest opening weekend gross of all time. Yep, Batman Forever literally kicked Jurassic Park's butt. And in addition to that, Batman Forever made $136 million more than Batman Returns. So it accomplished what it set out to do, make Batman less scary and safer and help audiences to forget Batman Returns. But despite Batman Forever being a welcome addition when it came out, its popularity has dwindled in time, to the point where it now only has a measly 39% on Rotten Tomatoes. So how did this go from a movie that everyone loves to a movie that everyone is kind of like, meh? Well, I think Batman and Robin tainted the love that people had for Batman Forever, as it was the other Joel Schumacher Batman movie, which was universally hated. And the two movies often get lumbered together. But I also think it's just the changing of the times. Like the James Bond movie Moonraker, it's a movie that was loved and embraced when it came out, only for people to say later that it's actually very silly, especially when compared to the more darker content of today. I think the fact that superhero movies have become so much darker and brooding is why Batman Forever hasn't really aged as well as the Burton Batman movies. But to be honest, I still find myself enjoying Batman Forever. Despite some of its flaws, it is a fun movie. And it's nice to return to a day where superheroes were allowed to be fun. So, is Batman Forever a good movie or a bad movie? Well, it's not really for me to say, as Batman seems to frequently have changes in his career. Often, the Batman mythos alternates from being dark and gothic to being light-hearted and comical. It depends on the popular collective consciousness at the time of seeing the movie. Those who have grown up with modern Batman with the likes of Christian Bale and Ben Affleck probably won't like Batman Forever. Whereas those who grew up watching Batman Forever may have a fond love for it. To me, it is an enjoyable movie, in a sort of Power Rangers kind of way. The movie knows that it's not meant to be taken seriously, but it's still going to have fun with it nevertheless. And it's nowhere near as bad as Batman and Robin. Anyway, I'm Minty, and BATMAN! Ah! Batman!